Hello, uh, this is the uh, phytoremediation discussion group uh, panel for um, the subject of phytoremediation. My name is Patrick Carey, and I'm the architecture editor for GreenRoofs.com. Um, I stumbled on the idea, uh, the, the concept of phytoremediation almost by accident. Um, I was trying to find a way to uh, irrigate a green roof with uh, gray water and realized that uh, through some cursory research that uh, plants could do a lot of cleaning uh, of, of gray water. And um, so I, it became a topic of interest for me because it's a way that uh, the air, the, the ground, and uh, the water can be cleaned through plants, and uh, which is the whole concept behind phytoremediation. Phyto meaning plant, remediation meaning uh, uh, healing or uh, remediating. And um, this can happen uh, for, uh, again, for soil, for water, for air, through a number of different mechanisms uh, that our group is going to uh, discuss and talk about. Um, the group I've assembled is, uh, uh, I demure from using the word expert in general, but uh, this is as close as you can get uh, for, uh, for a panel discussion for this topic. Um, uh, uh, one panelist, uh, Dr. Paul Mankiewicz is the executive director of the Gaia Institute. He received his PhD from the City um, University of New York, uh, New York um, Botanical Garden Joint Program in Plant Sciences. He holds patents on a modular in-vessel composting system, an ultralight green roof plant growth medium, and a biogeochemical reactor to break down di uh, dioxins and PCBs. Uh, the past president of the Tory Botanical Society and board member of the New York um, City Soil and Water Conservation District and former chair of the Bronx Solid Waste Advisory Board. He has designed and built natural uh, landscapes to remove metals, hydrocarbons, and excess nutrients from runoff and wastewater, uh, capture carbon, and to lower air conditioning and heating costs. Dr. Mankiewicz has uh, constructed the first green roof in the Bronx, New York, uh, the first industrial scale stormwater treatment uh, meadow, and a green wall at Sims Recycling, a six acre truck to uh, barge material handling facility in the Bronx River. Uh, the first process uh, water, gray water treatment green roof on the Linda Tool uh, Corporation in Red Hook, uh, Brooklyn. And the, and the first 10 of the mayor's uh, Plan New York City 2030 enhanced uh, tree pits for um, uh, street side stormwater capture, as well as the first community garden constructed for lead uh, mitigation, as well as stormwater capture. Um, this is a, in, in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, Dr. Alan uh, Darlington has 30 years experience in uh, the area of, of plant environment interactions. Uh, this started in the mid 80s with his work investigating the use of mycorrhizal fungi, fungi uh, in the establishment of tree species in metal contaminated soils. He went on to be awarded his PhD investigating the interaction between plants and their atmospheric um, environment. Alan has received a number of awards for academic and entrepreneurial accomplishments and is the inventor of a number of patents integral to uh, plant-based biofilters, which um, has been his area of interest since 1994. These systems combine biofiltration and phytoremediation specifically for application in occupied spaces. Uh, Alan formed Air Quality Solutions Limited in 2001 where he was successful, where he successfully transferred the technology from the laboratory to the marketplace, and in 2008 merged uh, Air Quality Solutions to form Nedlaw Living Walls Incorporated. Uh, he was named by Outdoor Magazine as one of the 25 top true believers in the environmental movement for his work with uh, plant walls. He still is active in the research community at a number of North American universities investigating the use of air biofilters in occupied spaces ranging from the mining industry to space applications. Uh, Dr. Clayton Rue, uh, PhD, is um, manager and technical director of Zero Floor America. Dr. Rue achieved his, or, or, I'm sorry, received his um, BS in botany and genetics 
and MS in plant biology, both from Ohio State University, and PhD in forest biotechnology from University of Georgia. Uh, Zero Floor America uh, was founded in 2002, concurrent with the um, 10.4 acre green roof installation on uh, Ford Dearborn, uh, the, the Dearborn, Michigan uh, Ford Rouge River truck plant. Um, prior to co-founding um, XFA, Dr. Rue was research professor of phytoremediation at Michigan State University, directing laboratory and field studies on plant-based detoxification of various <coughs> pollutants, including mercury, PCBs, um, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and nitroaromatic explosives. Dr. Rue's work at Michigan State University and University of Georgia included multidisciplinary research collaborations in phytoremediation, bioplastic composites, biofuels, and green roof technologies, which have been presented in more than 50 peer-reviewed uh, journal publications and 200 lecture seminars. But from my understanding I, of, of, of phytoremediation and my readings on it, um, the idea behind it is that uh, the plants can actually, uh, through a number of different pro processes, clean what they encounter, meaning it's the soil, air, and water, uh, to a certain degree. Certain plants can target certain pollutants in the air or the water, um, and uh, there's a number of different processes that, 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 uh, that plants use um, to, to achieve this. Um, so that said, um, I'd like to turn the... Um, uh, the, uh, the the what the mic over to uh, to Paul and uh, to talk about some of the uh, classifications of what's out there uh, that needs to be clean, cleaned up. All right, very good. I'm gonna. I actually sent along a finally got. I had much too large a PowerPoint, but I eventually got it over to you folks. But uh, um, I'm gonna describe essentially the phase space, so to speak, for how remediation works. Uh, now the plants have been a great contribution to the biosphere's ecology for 420 million years or so, the land plants, but we also have to recognize that plants fit into a context. As my professor used to say, the best biochemists on the planet are the bacteria and following them uh, are the fungi and third, uh, but uh, still major contributors, are the, the plants and especially the land plants themselves. What we have to think of in the remediation technology application is that we're essentially looking at a huge battery. The function, functional capacity of organisms that actually makes remediation possible is the flow of electrons and the biosphere in a way is a huge sun-driven battery that literally runs electrons from sources to sinks. <coughs> And it's a complicated thing, but there's a figure that uh, I've passed along that shows the phase space, so to speak, the electron acceptors. Now, the reason that you and I, the, all of us, can run the 10-minute, 100-meter uh, dashes, 10-second, uh, 100-meter dashes, I think we're probably a little slower than that, uh, but it's basically uh, the use of oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. Next, down the line, so to speak, uh, there's a number of complicated steps with metals and all uh, in facultative organisms, uh, pseudomonad bacteria. But the next uh, major step is where nitrate, NO3, becomes the terminal electron acceptor, and denitrification and the production of nitrogen into the atmosphere is a step there, and I'll tell you in a little bit why I'm bringing that one up as well. The third step down, that is lower energy released and requiring less oxygen or zero oxygen for its production is sulfate as a terminal electron acceptor. And the last one is carbon dioxide itself where methane is produced in methanogenic systems. And these, the, those three, nitrate, sulfate, and carbon dioxide are basically very, very ancient, <clears throat> way before the oxygen producing systems uh, turn the atmosphere around. And I'm telling you this because it's those electron flows that allow for the remediation of the major problematic materials in the biosphere for us, and those are metals of various kinds, from heavy metals to trace metals to uh, uh, metals that we need all the time, uh, hydrocarbons, 
basically carbon uh, uh, connected together in uh, essentially alkanes, so the simple carbon chains, alkenes with double bonds, and then BTEX, benzene, toluene, and the rest, gasoline derivatives that are basically ring compounds, and then uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which are ring compounds connected together, and then the worst class are the hyperstabilized polyaromatic hydrocarbons with chlorine attached to them. Um, all of these are fair game to natural systems, but um, uh, we'll get to that a little more in a second. The other problematic materials are the nutrients, and the two big ones are phosphorus and nitrogen in estuarine and uh, uh, terrestrial systems, and those basically are just a matter of concentrations, having too many for the capacity of organisms, especially plants, to remove them and bacteria to denitrify in the case of nitrogen. So the challenge, and it's a spectacular one because we're just getting on this, and it's great to be on this panel because people are really looking, obviously, seriously at this and have done great work uh, on the phytoremediation from coupled systems with plants plus uh, the fungi, fungal components, but uh, the opportunity of green roofs, green walls, street side plantings, and all its remediation systems is that they basically can be put in place where the major sources of pollutants are. Their weakness, or what we haven't really fully exploited today, is that the scale of and the kinetics, the capacities of these systems have to be matched against the pollutant inputs, what we want to deal with and treat. When you're looking at green roofs, obviously you've got a thin medium, and it's not just the volume of that medium, but the surface area that basically is running the show. Let me say a word on that. The volume is the volume, whatever it is, the square footage by the area, I mean, the, you know, the square footage by, times the depth it will give you the how much volume you have, but really it's the volume of the critical components, the humic matter. And humus is neat stuff. There's about 2,000 square meters of surface area per gram of humic matter. So huge amounts of surface, and that uh, is also well populated with pseudomonad and other bacteria that have tremendous capacities for dealing with uh, pollutants, especially things on the carbon side, uh, uh, hydrocarbons like uh, down into benzene and toluene. Uh, but the volume is going to be limited. The green wall, of course, you have a tremendous area potential. In New York City, we've got 30 square miles of rooftop and probably 3,000 or more square miles of roof of wall space. But really what we have to look at is how the rhizosphere, how the root zone can permeate the medium and how we can connect that with a you know, pollutant source so, well, so we can basically get rid of those materials. Uh, street side plantings, again, we've got 6,300 miles of <coughs> roadway. So there's a lot of capacity, but exactly how to couple pollutants with that is uh, uh, a technology we need to solve. I've built a number of pieces where the roadway runoff runs into these systems, and there's a, a few photos that I've passed along on this, uh, or will, and that basically shows that you can take water from street sides and run it into a, think of a very large tree pit, not five feet by five feet, but five by 20, five by 30, five by 40, and you're starting to get into a thousand, two thousand gallon per storm capacity. But capacity is not enough because there's critical parameters. I mentioned one, surface area of your remediation um, biochemical, biogeochemical surface. So for something like tree roots, according to a great thesis done uh, out of uh, uh, Yale School of Forestry years back, Tim Woods, there's something like 15 to 20 linear miles of fine roots under every square meter of northeastern forest and meadow. Uh, now I'd like to somebody to offer a, a hypothesis, a, a notion as to how much <laughs> surface area of mycorrhizal fungi they are, but bigger than that by quite a bit. So we're looking at a huge surface area, and that's really a capacitor for how these things work. One which is the most critical now, so surface area, rates of uptake, reaction kinetics. Third one is hydroperiod, or the time that the system can work on a Problem, the problem at hand on removing the pollutants. Typically in constructed wetlands, you're looking at two to three days to get an order of magnitude, uh, two orders of magnitude re removal, 90, 99%. And that's the problem to solve with green roofs and green walls because how to make them 
scaled properly for the loads is something we need to address. And it's a huge opportunity because we can build these kinds of systems uh, coupled with industrial sites, coupled probably with even industrial wastewater or treated uh, wastewater from uh, municipalities and the like. So uh, the opportunity is enormous. The <coughs> data that we have on these systems themselves in cities is uh, small but growing. The data we have from uh, really 30 to 40 years of research on constructed wetlands, on soil systems, mm -hmm. is quite enormous and getting larger. And we need to basically recouple the great land-grant universities uh, uh, with the industrial facilities, with the capacity of uh, our building right now in cities and testing these things to actually move forward. All right. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Um, uh, next to, uh, uh, I'd like to ask to, to, to speak is uh, Clayton Rue. Um, uh, Clayton's been involved, as I described in his background, with a, a, a lot of research with regard to fire remediation. And if, if you could describe some of the processes that uh, the, the plants, the uh, rhizosphere uh, elements uh, uh, use to um, uh, deal with pollutants, we appreciate it. So uh, take it away, Paul. I mean, sorry, take it away, Clayton. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and I'll try to make a very brief uh, summary of, of the uh, different technologies and applications that are um, used under the umbrella of fighter remediation. Um, I should first say that uh, I guess technical fighter remediation is actually um, cleanup of fairly heavily polluted sites. So the conventional uh, use of the word is is not just the normal things that plants do in our lawns and in our uh, parks and on uh, even on our roofs. It's actually to use plants in a very um, hostile environment to detoxify or remove fairly um, uh, acute levels of pollution. Um, now, I, I will take that moment to, um, I, I guess, give a modern application of phytoremediation, which is uh, uh, the things that we're going to talk about later today, I think. Um, and that's, a, that's an area that I've, oh, I don't know, somewhat tongue-in-cheek have uh, named phytopremediation. So this is similar to the concept of pre-cycling. So one way to avoid uh, throwing out a lot of trash is not to buy trash or to buy things that aren't uh, packaged in a lot of trash. So some people call that <coughs> pre-cycling. Uh, the same concept applies to phytopremediation is where you use plants, uh, in, uh, for example, in urban environments to mitigate low-level inputs of pollution to keep them from accumulating to toxic levels. Uh, again, uh, the classical definition of phytoremediation is to uh, use plants to treat more um, intensely contaminated waters or soils. Uh, so those would be the applications I'm focusing on right now. Um, the one basic category is really the original um, application of phytoremediation is so-called phytoextraction, where plants are used to extract and concentrate uh, typically metal pollutants. Um, again, uh, as Paul uh, referenced, plants are very good at pulling uh, mineral nutrients out of the soil uh, and, and it just so happens that a variety of species of plants or plants under certain um, soil treatment conditions can take up unusually high levels of uh, metal or nutrient pollutants and store them in their above ground tissues. For phyto extraction, this application does uh, stabilize the soil from erosion, um, allows these metals to be taken up into the leaves or the stems, at which point um, it is essential that those stems and leaves are harvested and the metals recovered from the uh, plant um, material. This is a great concentrating step, so it's far superior to just uh, using um, steam shovels to put everything in dump trucks and bury it in landfills. So some of the concentration factors that have been associated with phyto extraction are 20,000 fold concentrations. So to put that into context, this is the difference between landfilling 20,000 barrels of contaminated soil or 
using phytoremediation to pull up that same amount of contaminant and then ashing it and burying one barrel of arsenic, for example. Some examples where this application has proven effective are uh, lead, zinc, and arsenic. An another similar uh, approach of plants interacting with metals is phytostabilization. This, this is an uh, approach that is desirable when it's not feasible to harvest the plant material or maybe the contaminants don't accumulate for the, quite to the concentration that would be economically or even ecologically viable solution. In phytostabilization, you're using soil binding properties and the root stabilizing properties of maintaining uh, otherwise uh, potentially um, harmful levels of metals in a soil uh, sequestered environment. And uh, that's another trick word. Some people do call this phytosequestration or phytostabilization. Now moving on to carbon-based pollutants, um, the ideal solution is phytodegradation, where some uh, petroleum compound or uh, organic solvents or maybe even pesticides can be accumulated into the plant tissues. Plant enzymes will break these pollutants down to harmful, uh, harmless products, or maybe they'll even be incorporated into cell walls or other stable inert materials inside the plant. So. In phytodegradation, we can bring up harmful pollutants and then render them harmless by the biochemical capabilities inside plant cells. This is a relatively rare, uh, uh, rarely uh, um, observed phenomenon, mostly because the uh, plants are either killed by the pollutants or the pollutants themselves aren't really readily uh, brought into the plant tissues. Um, more often the process is a consortia of root uh, activities with microbes that inhabit the root zone, otherwise known as the rhizosphere. Um, in many cases, in most cases I should say, the microbes are enhanced in their numbers or in their metabolic activity by compounds or materials released from the roots. Um, and this process is called phytostimulation or using the term uh, about the, the root zone rhizosphere, it's also called rhizodegradation. Meaning again, the pollutants are in the soil, they typically don't accumulate up into the plant tissues, instead the soil environment uh, degrades them to harmless byproducts. Uh, this, this has been effectively demonstrated for <clears throat> nitroaromatic explosives, uh, petroleum byproducts, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and even really environmentally durable compounds like DCBs. Um, and uh, there's a few, few other subgroups, but these basic categories are the most uh, prevalently used and applied. So I'll, I'll stop there and we'll probably have opportunities to look at those again later. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Clayton. Uh, the ne next up is uh, Alan Darlington. And um, uh, I've asked Alan to uh, go through some of the um, uh, the applications that are currently in use um, to address uh, fire remediation needs within the built environment. So, uh, Alan, take it away. Thanks, Patrick. Um, really, before even getting going, uh, I think we should stop and, again, putting a bit of a plug in for the whole fire remediation approach. You look at a lot of green technologies out of there, and by that I mean things like photovoltaics, uh, wind generation, um, geothermal, all of which are getting a really big push from the green industry. From a plant science perspective, I tend to look back and say, where's the chlorophyll? I mean, so really what we're trying to do here is look at different ways of approaching uh, solving problems in the build. Not so much through biomimicry, which is the traditional green technology approach, but by harvesting or engineering biological solutions into the build to come up with the right solution. We can do that, but a lot of times we have to step back and, and make sure we design it right. The solution is there in nature, we just have to package it properly. Um, really the, the real thing with the built environment is that it is really just a closed ecosystem. Um, that a lot of the work that came out of this was based upon uh, very closed ecosystems, such as the work done by NASA or in my particular experience with the 
Melissa group out of the uh, European and Canadian space agencies where they're looking at closed environments. There they're looking at not only the, the food production associated with closed environments, but waste productions. And you look at what they're dealing with in those systems, and it's basically what we're dealing with in any built environment. You have water waste, you have uh, solid waste, and they have to be dealt with properly. And with the water waste, it, with reference to the um, the built environment as we have it, is the water waste is twofold. One is the uh, water runoff from the building, stormwater treatment, which are treated by systems like bioswells or holding areas where the, the water can be held for a period of time before being released, so to speak, into the general environment to get rid of any contaminants or silts and materials in it. The other water that we're dealing with in the built environment is the gray or black water, the, the water from our uh, used from our sewage system. Gray water being uh, water that you get from showers and washing materials. Black water is from the sewage directly. Both those systems um, can be treated with uh, phytoremediation technologies. The, the eco machines, the, the living machines are very good examples of how those contaminants can be removed uh, with plant-based systems. Where the other contaminants we're dealing with in the um, built environment are the solid materials. And there are examples out there, uh, particularly reference I know at the University of Guelph, where they're looking at um, composting systems in buildings and dealing with the uh, wastewater associated with that, the manure tea as it's referred to, as a, as a feedstock for uh, botanical systems. The last contaminant that we're, or vehicle that we're talking about with indoor air is, or within the built is the indoor air and how we can use biological systems to remediate that contaminant is traditionally what is dealt with is that air is uh, contaminants build up in the space and is simply released back into the environment. Uh, there are technologies out there like biofiltration, which are plant-based and can remove those contaminants before they're released out into the site. I think what Paul was saying about the neat thing with uh, phytoremediation as a whole is that typically these are on-site technologies, that these are things that can be dealt with on-site and, and the contaminants removed or sequestered before being generally released into the, into the general e ecosystem. So I think that's one of the real important things is to get these technologies or that these technologies are building specific is that they can be tied right into the building to avoid the release of these contaminants into the general uh, environment. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, yeah, it's interesting that sometimes I think of uh, the, big, uh, the green roof movement and the living wall movement as uh, one of the steps where nature is starting to push back, where we're starting to re-establish um, our relationship with the built environment and nature um, to the point where uh, perhaps we have been overbuilding and uh, we've uh, created uh, a legacy of, um, of uh, problems that now we have to clean up. Um, I'd like to go into a, um, a, a series of longer um, uh, presentations and discussions with the, with the individual pan panelists. Um, and this has to do with talking about their individual work, uh, uh, projects that they've either done themselves or have uh, found of interest <coughs> that other pe pe people have been doing. Um, and uh, again, this, these sections are open for, uh, for discussions and questions um, uh, from other panelists and uh, certainly from myself. I have less of a depth of understanding of these things than you guys do. Um, so, okay, for uh, starting off with uh, Paul, um, I, when I visited you in, uh, in New York, um, I was very impressed by the, uh, the, the truck surface runoff system that you had set up where you were using um, runoff water to spray down a uh, moss impregnated wall that where the the water then went into a uh, a swale that then seeped into the uh, uh, the river again in almost a completely clean clean state um, I mean, you all have projects like that in your history and I'd love you love to uh, have you talk about them uh, both in terms of the benefits and some of the drawbacks and challenges that you faced in uh, in, in realizing them so, okay, Paul, you're first up. 
Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Just, just very quickly, uh, I, there. I think I'm the only person who's used a 400 uh, million year old uh, biosphere uh, technology to treat uh, metals from a recycling facility in the in the Bronx. But the, the idea is very simple. You have tremendous surface area in bryophytes, mosses, and liverworts and their relatives. And what we did was catch the runoff from a six and a half acre site in a fringing wetland. It drops through a soil column into the ground. They've got 240 storm chambers underground, plus a large open space below the working surface of this metal recycling and plastic recycling facility. And I've got um, large solar pumps uh, moving water through a wetland system and over this wall. And the idea is very simple. You bring the potential pollutant load in contact with the filtration medium. Uh, unbelievably simple, but uh, as Alan was just mentioning, the, the, what you need is the increase in volume, capacity, surface area of exactly that chlorophyll-driven system. Uh, in this case, it's bryophytes. In other cases, it's the land plants and the multiple families. But it's a scaling issue. And the cost of that is probably negative. You build an Olmstead Park or something like an Olmstead Park, like a Central Park, like uh, the beautiful mountain in Montreal. Uh, but you couple that in some, in some ways with the uh, potential pollutant runoffs. And your capacitors are enormous. We just have ignored that part of the design palette to make things work better. And that's what I tried to do at the SIM site. Paul, um, on that site, have you... Um determined um, at what stage the plants are going to be saturated with uh, pollutants and, and what you would do with them after, you know, they're, they're already fill, filled up? Yeah, that was a great point that Clayton brought up, uh, basically how much capacity you've got. And that's critical. Uh, the, for the mosses, they, and liverworts, they tend to, there's some pretty good studies, they tend to pick metals up and let them go again. But uh, my colleague uh, Joshua Chang out of Brooklyn College and I have got data on the uh, on the soil column, which we're constantly renewing with wood chips. And I keep on not talking about plants, and I partly depending on my colleagues here to actually bring them in because everyone knows they run the system, but they run it in couple connected with uh, microbial consortia. But here, uh, I, I, uh, not to. Uh, disparage anybody's age here. Nobody's going to live long enough to see those that soil column fully saturated with metal so it starts relieving it. It's uh, even though even though they're breaking up engine blocks and dragging refrigerators across the surface, all that stuff's getting run into my soil column. Uh, basically by adding wood chips, depending on the microbes that break them down, and then getting sesquioxides and polyphenolics and the rest and humic matter to couple with the metal. Uh, uh, you look good, Patrick, but you're not going to live past the 80 years, whatever it is, when this stuff. Anyway, it's we have this large. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate your subtlety. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, let me see here. Next up, uh, Clayton. Um, yes, sir. I, 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 so, have to, I have to mention this too that I, I, I met Clayton for the first time at a fire remediation conference that I just sort of stumbled in by 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 accident. Um, uh, the other two panelists were from the Green Roof and Living Wall world, uh, so it was interesting to, to see that uh, just by accident he was involved with Zero Floor. I had no idea that he was involved with the Green Roofs yeah. at all. So, yeah. um, All right, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Not a worry. Well, that's the fun thing about Fido is it means plant, so it's everybody. Uh, and, and I guess one of, one of the real founders of the fighter remediation concept, a gentleman, Ilya Raskin at Rutgers University, uh, had a pretty fun observation that um, the first fighter remediation experiment was when green algae uh, decontaminated the Earth's atmosphere and filled it with oxygen. So that, that, was, a, that was a fun observation. Um, um, our, our, my uh, studies at Michigan State were a little less ambitious, um, but we tried to do something interesting anyway. Um, one of the uh, good opportunities I had when I got to Michigan State was, was to work with Ford Motor Company, who was, um, in addition to eventually putting the world's largest green roof on their new truck assembly plant, um, they also had a legacy um, steel uh, manufacturing operation at the Rouge um, Manufacturing Complex. Uh, some of that area was back in the good old days when all, all the materials were made on site on Mr. Ford's great integrated manufacturing vision. They were bringing raw coal and um, heating it up and driving off the, uh, the contaminants in the coal, if you will, the impurities, to make 
pure coke for steel manufacture. Well, all the, uh, the impurities that they couldn't convert into important industrial byproducts were stored or spilled onto the grounds of that facility. And um, I was contacted to help them identify <coughs> ways to use a low-cost biological means to uh, rehabilitate that, uh, those soils. Um, our approach was to use Michigan native plant species, if possible, to uh, re colonize that um, that uh, surface soil um, and uh, we started uh, looking at species just we're essentially going through uh, uh, the nursery uh, picking everything off the shelf that we could find and testing it in greenhouse trials we went through about a hundred and fifty different um, upland and wetland and woody and grass uh, type species and found about 20 that deserved testing out in a field environment. So we prepared a, a few plots out at a closed landfill site that Ford Motor Company um, happened to own, mixed a few different recipes of organic compost from animal litter and uh, recycled yard waste and so forth, planted all these different species and um, replicate plots in the soil and observed some interesting things happening. The most common thing was nothing. So the pollutants were polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which were uh, referenced earlier um, by uh, Paul as um, cyclic uh, clusters of organic carbon uh, uh, chemicals, and they're pretty resistant to environmental decay, mostly because they're not really water soluble. So they sort of stick to soil uh, humic matter and, and very slowly uh, are attacked by microbes. Well, in our case, we observed that the majority of the plants didn't do much more than just mixing it with compost, fertilizing, and aerating it. So we saw about a 20% reduction of the pollutant in three years of our trial. However, um, five of the species accelerated that breakdown rather uh, aggressively. So we saw as much as 50 to 60% of the pollutant was removed from these very long-lived, these are 100-year-old contaminated soils, by the way. Oh. So in three years' time, we had uh, managed to um, degrade uh, about 60, to, uh, at least 60 percent of the pollutant uh, in the soil. Well, this does go back to uh, something that you spoke about in terms of uh, pre-remediation. Uh, uh, we were doing a, uh, a phytoremediation tank, a uh, phytoremediation treatment for um, uh, gray water, and uh, we found that it was very efficient as long as we controlled the quality of the gray water that went into the system. Uh, but once you started including all kinds of pollutants that went into the gray water, the plants became plants and and, and their uh, what the rhizospheres became less um, less effective. Um, and which goes along, which actually leads me to the next uh, to the next speaker. Uh, exactly. One of the um, uh, issues that we had uh, when I was doing some work with the American Lung Association was uh, uh, volatile organic compounds and in in indoor air pollutants. And uh, by reducing the uh, uh, or by changing uh, our building materials to emit less uh, volatile organic compounds, there's less in the air to pollute. However, those that do exist and the, the other kinds of air air pollutants that um, that are inevitable. Um, uh, Alan has been working with a really great uh, uh, system to um, uh, to phytoremediate uh, air pollution, and um, so it's your turn, Alan. Sure, sure. take sure. it away. Thank, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah, and actually, uh, our focus has been on the volatile organic compounds, and these are low molecular weight uh, organics, which fall into the category of things like benzene, formaldehyde, toluene which relative to the sort of things that Clayton is dealing with, there are absolute candy for microbes um, and biological systems. These things are much more readily degraded, uh, much less persistent, but they still can accumulate uh, to the point of influencing the well-being of uh, people. Our particular interest is the, again, the, the enclosed environment within buildings. Um, the way buildings operate is they are basically structures to protect ourselves from the hostile environment outdoors. It's too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter. So we make buildings that separate us from the outdoor conditions. These buildings are great. They allow us to enjoy temperatures that are fairly routine and consistent, but they also, by putting up that barrier, um, stop the movement of air from inside the space to outside. 
is that inside the space, because there's no free movement of air, the garbage that arises in the air, such as uh, off-gassing from furniture, equipment, computers, uh, building materials, and the people themselves can accumulate to the point of being detrimental to the well-being of the occupants. What is traditionally done is ventilation, is they bring outside air um, into the building, and uh, the comment was made earlier about uh, uh, pushing things outside and making it somebody else's problem. Our saying used to be the solution to pollution is dilution. So by bringing in outside air into the building, all they're doing is diluting it, and pushing it outside and, and making it uh, somebody else's problem. The other part of that is that they are taking um, air on a day like today, and in, it's, I'm calling from Ontario, and it's about freezing outside. You have to bring that air and heat it up to an adequate temperature within the space. And in the summer, you have to take air that can be, you know, 25 or 30 degrees Celsius or in the mid 80, high 80s Fahrenheit, cool it down to a reasonable temperature before spreading it throughout the space and, and conditioning that additional air to deal with the contaminants that are in the indoor space can be 30% of the energy consumed in the building. So our idea is, well, can we, rather than going outside and getting the fresh air, can we generate it within the building using biological systems? And our solution was a combination of a number of technologies, um, phytoremediation, as we're talking about here, uh, biofiltration, which is the passing of a contaminated air or water stream through a biologically active zone where the beneficial microbes consume the contaminants, and hydroponics. So what we have is a hydroponic wall with green plants integrated right into it and that we're actively drawing the air through the, the plant mass to get the air into the root zone where the beneficial microbes can consume it. Now, the question is, is why do we even have the plants in the system? Is that, as was said, the uh, two things you have to do is you have to get the contaminants into a place where they can be degraded, and then once they're there, you have to have the microbes there that can do the degradation. The plants facilitate the degradation process. The green plants, what they do is they create the environment where these, these, these beneficial microbes can exist. Um, as Clayton was saying, they can tailor their microbial populations in a very cool way. They can release exudates that shift populations from, um, or to increase the populations of these micro uh, contaminant degraders, and they can they, they have a huge impact on it. Comparing it to a, and so that's one thing they do is they release uh, exudates that specifically modify the microbial populations. The other thing they do is just with their normal plant growth, with roots living and dying and, and degrading, they can increase, increase the overall microbial populations. Uh, with an industrial biofilter, what they do is they pass the contaminated air or water through a biologic, um, through a substrate like um, a soil mix. And it works very well for a number of years, but the, the, the system has to be replaced, the, the substrate has to be replaced because the, the microbes run out of steam, so to speak. It runs out of organics. By integrating the plants right into the biofilter, what we're doing is we're constantly rejuvenating the organics in the system. So it's like a self-perpetuating filter with always new um, organics in it. Now, in terms of Comparing it again to an industrial circumstance, the indoor air biofilter, although the contaminants are high enough to have a huge impact on our well-being, by industrial standards they're very low. Instead of dealing with contaminants in the parts per thousand or the parts per million, we have to deal with parts per, bil parts per billion. And the other problem is we have to deal with extremely large volumes. So our system is modified to take a very high volume of air into this root zone and be able to deal with very low concentrations of the contaminant. Get rid of these trace elements that are actually having an impact and getting the clean air. Um, we've done a great deal of work looking at the, the performance of these things and the nice thing is, is that we can uh, validate very clearly that the air quality in terms of the garbage in the air coming out the backside of the biofilter is as good or better than outside air. So we're getting down to outside levels. Uh, and with the sort of volumes we can treat with the system, we can show that we can reduce the overall contaminant load in a space by almost 30% um, with the installation of a biofilter. Uh, we could also 
with, with the reducing of the contaminants inside the space is the more normal application, but you could also then uh, reduce the amount of outside air you're bringing into the building to um, minimize the energy consumption of the space as well. So really, um, it's the green plants that are powering the, the system. And we've done some work with uh, Drexel University where they're going through and, and looking at the different plant species, uh, looking at how they interact with the the degrading populations of microbes, not only off in a virgin environment, but also with um, as the biofilter matures, how these populations change. And there are some very specific and very promising interactions between the plants and microbes. But again, the idea that with these systems, plants are creating the environment where the beneficial microbes can do their work. Um, and I guess just in summary, and it might be a bit of a uh, terminology thing, but really there's this, the difference between phytoremediation and biofiltration. Typically in my mind, in remediation systems, the, the contaminant is, is stationary. So it's like, again, that you have uh, a soil that's got contaminants in it and you're go up using the plants to clean it up. With a filtration system, the contaminants are in a mobile phase. So as we actively draw the air through the biofilters or in a wetland system, the water flows. So I, I think that's basically where I'll end for now. But again, the idea that the plants are creating the environment where the beneficial microbes can do their work is really what we're, we're pushing with the biofilters. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, I, just a question I have to ask for you. Uh, sometimes with a lot of uh, living walls in particular, um, uh, have um, I know from the history of uh, Patrick Blanc's walls, which are not designed as phytoremediation elements, um, there are uh, there's a lot of species replacement that goes on uh, for any number of reasons. Uh, one reason might be that uh, living wall technology is uh, certainly newer uh, than um, green green roof technology um, or the understanding of those systems. Um, have you run into uh, uh, the challenge of having to replace um, a species more frequently than uh, would normally happen in say a uh, say a roof or a in other sorts of uh, vegetated con contexts? Um, what I, I was trying to, um, I would say that probably the life expectancy of a, a well-managed plant wall would be the same as a house plant. Is that, and it's basically the same criteria, is that the wall needs adequate water, it needs adequate light, and it needs adequate uh, maintenance in terms of the avoidance of pests. A lot of times we get ourselves into situation, I mean, we as an industry, of getting the wrong technology in the wrong location is that we assume that the, um, the conditions were going to be different than they actually are. So uh, light is probably, in our systems, one of the major criteria that affects the overall performance. Uh, you put it into a system, you think you're going to get a certain load of light and it's not there. So the plants degrade over time. We go for about a 90% survival every year in our plants, which is a pretty good ratio, even again for house plants. Um, the one thing that we've realized is that with any technology, there the probably the biggest problem is the, I'll say the human aspect, is that the wall fails because somebody forgot to turn on a water line, the wall fails because they thought the lights were on at night and it wasn't. So with any biological system or any process, uh, the degree to which we can automate and put in the controls to avoid those sort of human error circumstances uh, greatly improve the overall performance. Um, have you found that um, the relative humidity of the indoor spaces is uh, significantly affected by introduction of large planted sur surfaces? Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. say, I, yeah exactly. I, I, I say this from, from, from the standpoint of once the relative humidity of an indoor space gets above a certain level, um, the um, uh, fungal and bacteria, especially the fungal uh, life in, uh, you know, in the enclosed area starts, yeah. starts to really yeah. skyrocket. Yeah, so there's, there's two or three issues there. Um, we do add humidity. Um, in the northern climes, like in Ontario here, during the winter months, they actually actively add humidity into the space. And the biofilter can be one of the ways to do that. We've actually had buildings where they've pulled out the steam humidifier and using our wall entirely. So in the winter months, it's, the humidification is good. 
Typically, we add about 10% relative humidity per pass. Uh, so it goes in at, I'm sorry, I'm Celsius, but let's say 22 degrees Celsius and 50% relative humidity. The air goes through and it's actively cooled through a evaporative cooling, but it comes out at 18 degrees Celsius and about 80% relative humidity. So you do get about a 10% increase in humidity, but you also get that cooling effect. And one of the things that, um, with basically you're shifting between the latent and sensible heat of the building, of the air going through the wall. And so in terms, in absolute sense, you're not changing the thermodynamics of the air at all, but you are changing the way the, the air handling system has to deal with it. So it does, uh, so the amount of energy you're getting to pull out or required to pull out that additional humidity is the same amount of energy as you're saving by the cooling of the air with the evaporative cooling. So in an absolute sense, it's not changing the thermodynamics. Um, one of the issues is also, again, it goes back to the idea of design, is to make sure that the biofilter is the right size for the space. Uh, there is a temptation because, I mean, the, the neat thing with, uh, well, with all phytoremediation technologies, it's, it's much more aesthetic than some of the, many of the industrial or almost all of the industrial applications for remediation. Um, I would much rather, from an aesthetic point of view, live next to a, a, a field that's being phytoremediated than one that's being dug out with, with and the dirt carted away. With our biofilters, it's the same thing, is that they, it is a, bio, a very aesthetic option for cleaning the air. And there is a temptation to put in too large of system. And if you oversize the system, as with any component, it throws the whole system out of whack. And that's another case where we found that humidity does come into play if you oversize the biofilter. Um, well, for one thing, um, is are these kinds of approaches, uh, not, Alan? You mentioned you already cited uh, the benefits for the for the, for the uh, uh, air cleaning uh, part of the um, the equation. But are these approaches significant? Have they produced significant results, or are they just sort of a nice thing that is uh, sort of ir like irrelevant in terms of the uh, the the built environment and the and the and the pollution that we find? Um, that's one question I'd really like to run, run, run by everybody. And also another question I'd like to run by everybody is uh, where do they see the, uh, the future of this going? I know that there are some limitations uh, just for the audience's sake. I know that the, one thing to keep in mind is that there are some particular plants that target particular pollutants in a number of di different ways. And so... Um, as uh, I tell people when we're designing green roofs and, and loving walls, that when you're, uh, there are two ways to, to design it. One way is to, to look at the constraints of an environment and figure out what plants will work on it. Another, work in that environment. Another way to do it is to say, I want to have this particular species of plant work. What can I do to environmentally set it up so that that plant does its job? Um, wetland plants, for instance, um, do a particularly good job with uh, certain kinds of phytoremediation. Um, other plants do really, really well with um, uh, airborne, um, airborne pollutants. Um, so let me see. So beyond that, uh, I'll shut up <laughs> and uh, uh, open the floor up. Uh, let's talk about significance of the effect of the, the efforts, efforts so, so far. far. Let, me, let me just start there because there's two uh, kind of unbelievably fundamental pieces that have been stated here. Alan just pointed out that uh, energy is not created or destroyed and thermodynamically uh, you're basically not getting anything for nothing but it's just pushing things in the <laughs> favorable direction for the winter especially for the summer you've got this humidity addition because of the sensible versus latent heat uh, equation. And that stuff goes back to the penman monteith equations from the 50s and 60s so we know this for a very long time. There's nothing new here. Uh, the other piece Clayton described uh, was exquisitely beautiful, uh, talking about basically you're getting the metals, metals again, matter is not created or destroyed, so we're standing on fundamentals here. Uh, so that way the significance is this, about as high as it gets. And let me just state, uh, suppose we take that biomass produced uh, in Clayton systems and then use it to create energy uh, uh, basically into in a, a, a plant to basically uh, burn the fuel, burn it as a, as a way of producing electricity. Now you've got this ash with high mercury, cadmium, lead, or whatever, whatever you're getting out of the soil. They're the largest capacitor, the largest system for turning metals into sulfide, which is basically the black smokers at the bottom of the ocean. But another very large one from work by DeTuro in out of Manhattan College here, as well as Gambrell and Patrick out of uh, uh, University of uh, uh, 
Louisiana State, uh, basically shows that acid volatile sulfide or sulfide concentrations will bind lead, cadmium, mercury, mole for mole, and make it possible literally to store it in an anaerobic environment indefinitely, as long as that environment stays anaerobic. You could also take with the waste material, and if there's some promising work, I'm sure Clayton knows this better than me, uh, electrochemistry. You can pull some of these things out with the right kind of electrochemical uh, uh, modes like they've done in mining for a very long time. And the third piece I'm going to say on the uh, 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 let me say, uh, unbelievably unanticipated additions to environmental quality. Clayton is literally changing the world with a hummingbird pollinated plant in the case of cardinal flower. Um, uh, come on, Patrick, give me an example where somebody's doing anything like this uh, with uh, standard technology. <laughs> uh, increasing the hummingbird, hummingbird ecology because you're pretty too. Oh, <laughs> and they're yeah. beautiful. Yeah, so uh, if you, you're not going to beat the aesthetic. Olmsted pointed out long ago that you literally get greater value out of landscape by making parks and green spaces where people live. Uh, we have the capacity to do that here. There's plenty of science that needs to be done, plenty of things we don't know. But this is a track that will literally change the quality of life for not just us, but for the hummingbirds and everything else as well. Can I, um, Patrick, if I can jump in at the same time, is it following up on what, what you're saying uh, about how robust nature is, is that um, using indoor air quality is, again, my area. Um, indoor air has about 300 different chemicals uh, that are routinely found in the indoor space. If you came up with a mechanical system or tried to come up with a, filter, a conventional filtration, a absorptive sort of activated charcoal filter approach to removing these things, it's very hard to get something that deals with everything. Is you, if you wanted to remove benzene, you would have to remove, you'd come up with a benzene filter. If you wanted to remove formaldehyde, you'd have to come up with a formaldehyde filter. The neat thing with biological systems is you put these biological systems in there and you, you're your thought is that you're dealing mainly with benzene or toluene, but because it's such a robust system, it is also able to deal with formaldehyde, methyl ethyl ketone, and things that we don't even expect that to do, it will be able to do. Um, shocks or, or traumas to the system are self-healing, is that if you, if you supercharge it by accident, you know, in my case, somebody drops a bottle of acetone in the space, the system can recover from it, from the damage all on its own. It's not like uh, a mechanical system where when a pump fails or uh, wears out, you have to replace it. The, with proper maintenance and, and stewardship, the biological system will be self-perpetuating. And it, it, it's, I think that's really the, the, the truly unique value of the biological systems is that they are self-regulating and self-perpetuating. Yeah, no, exactly right. Um, let me see. So, um, does anyone else have any uh, uh, thing to add for the uh, for the open discussion? Something that we've missed? Something that needs to be thrown in? Well, I, I guess I want to um, say a, a couple quick things. I, I, again, so it's sort of the conventional definition of phytoremediation is cleaning up pretty chronically or, or, or acutely contaminated sites. Um, but I think the broader definition uh, that's used nowadays is is far more impactful in that uh, green roofs and living walls and um, bioswales and all these other uh, technical landscaping approaches are really going to have a much more um, important um, uh, energy conserving and, and environmentally restorative impact than, than the old traditional approaches uh, of phytoremediation per se. Um, the reason for that is, again, the target pollutant uh, or the target sites that are were f the driving force of fighter uh, early days of fighter remediation, meaning the early 90s, were pretty much like Love Canal or, or literally Chernobyl. And people were out there trying to figure out ways to get any variety of plants, sometimes even crop type plants, all the way up to naturally a, a wild, a wild environment um, species. But the, the, bio, the bottom line is I, I kind of, we came up with a couple of fun little phrases about fighter remediation, one of which was, we were cheaper than lawyers. <laughs> so, so, and, but unfortunately, the, 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 the other side of the coin was we were slower than bulldozers. So, so you ended up having kind of the, the two sides of the coin for trying to clean up these acutely contaminated sites. And, and really, we, we found that 
because of the potential for uh, exposure or risk of escape of the pollutants by a slow process, it was hard to uh, uh, justify it in a, in a cleanup um, protocol. And really, in many cases, it was more important to find the hot spots of the contaminant and clean those up using conventional engineering methods, bulldozers or, or plasma furnaces or whatever. And then the peripheral areas, which might be 90% of the impacted area, use uh, the planted strategies on. And, and that was a process known as phytopolishing. You know, use those to uh, clean up the shallow or the, or the uh, relatively dilute pollutants. Um, and then uh, when you had the luxury of time. I think, again, for areas uh, that, that, that millions of square feet of green roofing that's going on and probably going to achieve millions of square feet of uh, uh, living, breathing walls and, and bio, uh, phyto facades and so forth over the coming years, and certainly the trillions of square feet of, of roadside habitats and, and parks and bioswales, et cetera, clearly we're going to take out Bi yeah. millions of times more contaminant in, in phyto pre-mediation and, um, and, and again, restorative ecological processes. So I guess I just wanted to kind of summarize that up as not to get too excited by the sexy going after mercury and lead aspects of phyto remediation, but also to respect the, the broader scale of the, of the more, um, uh, I don't know, prescriptive um, environmental protectorative uh, approaches. Sure. I, sometimes I think of this approach as being a, a threatened by the same kind of mentality that uh, antacid tablets provide. Uh, people take a lot of antacid tablets, <laughs> figuring that they don't have to change their diet whatsoever. And I think we also have to change our diet as well as uh, uh, use uh, remediation te techniques. Okay, that's it. And um, thank you all very much. Believe me, I, I've learned quite a bit from this. And I actually wish we had more time than we do uh, uh, to talk about this topic. Um, goodbye. <laughs>